what matters to Beijing, what matters to the CCP and G personally, is power preservation. And economic growth is no longer part of that conversation. It's about the politics. It's about the security lockdown. It's about setting the narrative. And to a degree, does that make China more dangerous? Certainly. But it also means that no matter what they do, China as an internationally diverse, economically wired country is not long for this world. Peter, welcome back to Real Vision. It's great to be back. So we spoke almost a year ago. Has uh, it been right a year? After, <laughs> yes, it seems like a century, I yeah. know, but it, it is a year. And we spoke um, right after Russia shocked much of the world by invading Ukraine. What's your assessment of the war right now? Well, I'm, I'm happy to say that not just my assessment, but everybody's assessment about how this war is going to shake out has been wrong. Uh, the Ukrainians have outperformed by every possible measure. The Russians have underperformed by every possible measure. The Americans have gotten involved in a way that I don't think anyone thought was possible. And the Europeans, even almost to every single country, have gotten involved in a way that's helped keep Ukraine alive. Uh, th this is still Russia's war to lose. And the challenges that Ukrainians are going to face in the second year are far greater than what they faced in the first. But they're still in the fight. And as long as it is still going on, a lot of the economic implications of the war have actually been deferred. And that's bought everybody a lot of time. Yeah, that's and that's a really interesting point. So on the military front, though, what do you think the challenges are? Is this a winnable war for either side? Oh, it's absolutely winnable for the Russians. Uh, in fact, it, it should have been an easy carry. It should have been over months ago. Uh, but give you an idea of what's going on. When, when the first part of the war started, the Ukrainians had only had eight years of preparation with a little bit of half-hearted help from the United States and the United Kingdom. Uh, and the rest of Europe kind of sat it out. Uh, they didn't have much of a military. Their economy was in shambles, had been for 30 years. And so th the expectations that they would just collapse you know, were, were legitimate concerns. On the Russian side, you've got the uh, second largest land army in the world, the second large or third largest air force in the world, and more artillery than God. So it should have been a walk in the park. It hasn't been. But now that we're in the second year and it's no longer the David Goliath situation, we have a fundamentally different battlefront shaping up. On the Ukrainian side, they're getting more and more equipment from the West. It's more and more advanced. And by the time we get to May, which is when they're going to be able to really get at each other once the uh, the ground firms up, the Ukrainians will have 60,000 new troops who have been training across NATO countries coming in with a lot of the newer gear. And it's going to be a very mobile force trained to Western standards. It's going to be completely different from anything the former Soviet Union has ever seen. But the Russians are going to be into their second mobilization. When they started the war, there were 100,000 Russians in Ukraine. Now there's closer to 250,000. And by the time we get to May, it's probably going to be closer to 600,000. So for every tank the West has donated to Ukraine, the Russians are bellying up with an extra 5,000 troops. This is going to be a very, very different conflict. Uh, and it, it sounds awful. I mean, that's really ominous. Uh, is it too simplistic to ask if the Russians have the the soldiers have the will to win in the same way the Ukrainians did. I mean, we see the articles, they're conscripted, they're not, you know, they abandon it. But is that, are, are we being sort of lulled into complacency by some of that? I mean, are they fit to fight? Everything you've identified is true. I mean, these soldiers are going to be badly equipped, badly led with low morale and horrible logistics behind them. But there's still more than a half a million of them. So as Stalin was fond of saying, quantity is a quality all its own. Mm -hmm. And every single Russian war in history, the first year of it has looked like what we've seen. It's been a logistical disaster with high casualties. And then in the second year, they rally to the cause and they throw bodies at the problem until it goes away. And in about mm -hmm. half of their wars, that works just fine. Wow, that's, that's so hard to hear. Do they have the resources, the economic resources to continue? And if not, do they get aid from somewhere else or privation. some other country? The sure. big We're talking about China, yep. <laughs> uh, privation is a Russian national pastime. So something like an economic recession or depression, which we really have not seen yet in Russia, 
uh, is not going to slow them down at all. They, they have mm-hmm. 70 years of Soviet legacy to burn through, 50 years of Soviet legacy to burn through. And yes, they're burning through it at a fast rate, but they've only recently really started to spin up their mystery, uh, industrial complex, military industrial complex, excuse me. So I don't think they're going to run out anytime soon. Um, they discovered that the equipment that they were buying for the North Koreans wasn't all that because, you know, artillery shells after a couple of decades kind of degrade and the North Koreans were giving them the really old stuff. So that's probably tapped out. Uh, in the case of Iran, Iran is not capable of mass production of their suicide drones. So the discussion now is to build a facility within Russia that can mass manufacture Iranian technology, which is just hilarious to say that out loud. Uh, but that's where we are. Uh, The big question is China. Now, in a sane universe where China is interested in its national and economic survival and success, the Chinese wouldn't even consider this. But that's not the world we're in. Chairman Xi has so purged the Chinese system of anyone who's capable of conscious thought that it is now just him. And in a cult of personality governing system, all it takes is some dumbass bureaucrat to think that doing this will stick it to the United States' eye, and so that is what the great leader wants, and to send a few cargoes of uh, of, um, of weapons. And I'm very concerned that that's exactly what's going to happen this year, that without any approval from Xi, someone mm-hmm. within the bureaucracy is going to take this inflammatory uh, action and force then the United States to do things. And that's exactly what we saw with the balloon fiasco. You know, here... There's a balloon that's 350 feet across dangling something the size of an MBR jet that you can see with the naked eye. And it completely torched bilateral relations. And it was the intelligence find of the decade for the United States because we basically flew a spy plane over it and a spy helicopter under it for nine days and got more information on Chinese capabilities and routing and uh, cryptography than we had in the last decade. But some idiot in the Intelligence Bureau thought it was a good idea. I'm afraid we're going to see that kind of miscalculation. Hi, I'm Raoul Pal, the CEO and co-founder of Real Vision. The financial world is a complicated world right now. It's a really complicated macro picture, and there's a lot of risks. Real Vision and our YouTube channel help you navigate those risks. So subscribe now to the channel and never miss an update. There is simply too much going on. So subscribe now. Thank you. So th- th- this is very interesting because it, this is a this is a what happens when you surround yourself with people who don't want to speak truth to power, right? Yeah. We've we've had this conversation before. We do hear pretty interesting language coming from Xi and the foreign minister. I mean, they're warning Western countries are trying to contain and suppress China. The foreign minister warning that the U.S. and China are hurtling toward confrontation and conflict. So the the verbiage coming from the very top is seems to be quite hot. Now they they understand now, four years on, that warrior wolf diplomacy was perhaps the dumbest thing in the history of their country. And China's been around for a long time, so that's a really hot statement. Uh, but they realize now that there is no technological future. Biden has killed that. There is no energy future because the Russians are killing that. And there is no financial future because they have killed that themselves with their housing market. They realize that their whole system now is teetering on the edge. And the question is, what's going to push it over? And they really, really need to ratchet it down if they're going to have a chance here. Because if the Americans are not part of the solution, there is no solution for them. We control the sea lanes. We control the energy and the agricultural markets. We're the largest consumer base. We're the source of most of their technology. They have to have a relationship. But they had come to that conclusion. And then the balloon fiasco happened. So the ability of the decision-making apparatus in China to make basic functionality of the system, that's now gone. And all that's left is press releases. But they're doubling down. I mean, if they're trying to in any way back-channel repair the balloon fiasco, they're, they're, it doesn't seem like that based on just the comments coming out as we speak. In public, it'll never happen, the whole Asian Mm. face thing. But this Mm. is very clearly a problem that the Chinese created themselves. And since Xi no longer has advisors that are worth their skin, it's got to all come direct from him. And, you know, let's assume that he's the smartest leader in world history. He's still only one guy. And he's got to personally manage every single detail of a multi-trillion dollar economy. He's, of course, he's going to fail. 
I want to I want to talk about China uh, in more depth in just a second, but I I want to stay with you know because we're talking a year after with the Ukraine situation because energy there were a couple things that happened right you mentioned energy briefly there were concerned dire concerns about what was going to happen especially to Europe it, with the energy situation but they managed through is this crisis averted or just delayed. Uh, well, one crisis has happened. It's just in stealth mode. Uh, let's deal with the one that hasn't happened because it still might. So uh, most Russian crude that is in Western Siberia is produced in the permafrost. And so if there's any appreciable take down of takeaway capacity because of boycotts or sanctions or whatever else, the pressure builds back up in the wells until you get to the permafrost and the wells freeze shut. The water that comes up as a byproduct of oil production turns into ice. And when water freezes into ice, it expands and it pops the pipes. Uh, we know this because it happened in 1992, and it took the fields offline for 30 years. Now, in Russia, to this point, that has not happened because they do have a little bit of a swing production. There's about a million barrels a day in the western part of the country that is not in permafrost, and that they can turn off and on. Now, when I had spoke to you a year ago, that million barrels a day had already gone offline, and like the next incremental barrel was in the danger zone. But the Europeans designed their sanctions specifically to allow crude to keep flowing. They're trying to reduce Russia's money, but they're not trying to destroy themselves. So they want to give themselves time to wean themselves off. Mm -hmm. And so a couple of weeks after I spoke with you, they started bringing that million barrels a day of swing production back online. And they've never gotten to that threshold again until now. Now, probably 700 to 800,000 of that swing is offline again. And we're now in an environment where every reinsurance company in the world has said, we're not going to insure any Russian vessels whatsoever. So the danger is still there. And with the insurance now coming from Indian and Chinese and Russian government entities that have never offered maritime insurance before, all it's going to take is one incident somewhere for us to get back to that scenario. But it hasn't happened yet. Mm. Uh, that's oil. Natural gas is actually simpler. Uh, the Nord Stream pipeline is gone. That was the primary, uh, that was the single largest uh, trunk line for natural gas transport in the world. And it was 40% of Germany's total demand. And when it went offline, we saw natural gas prices in Germany rise by roughly a factor of eight. Now, if you look at natural gas prices today, you will notice that they're pretty low, but three things have happened that are not sustainable. Number one, temperatures in Europe have been 30 degrees above average for almost eight weeks, historically yeah. unprecedented. So demand is lower on the consumer side. Second, uh, China was in lockdown for most of that period and still hasn't spun up all the way. So global demand for liquefied natural gas has been low. Mm. But third and most importantly, the Germans shut down their industrial space. They're not making fertilizer or smelting aluminum or forging steel right now. So it's come at the cost of German heavy industry. And German heavy industry is not like American heavy industry. We, For us, that's an economic sector into itself. Some imports, some exports, some deals with the U.S. domestic economy. Not in Germany. In Germany, the natural gas does, isn't just used for power. It's used to make the base materials in the petrochemical system that then inform their entire manufacturing sector. And without that, there is no German manufacturing sector. So BASF is physically dismantling their industrial plant within Germany and shipping it to other places, most notably Louisiana, to tap places where there still is natural gas, hoping that they can ship the chemicals back to the, their home country to save their economic system. But that would require a build out in Louisiana that happens faster than what the Nazis did during World War II. So we're probably at the beginning of the end of the entire German industrial model. Uh, all they've managed to do is delay it just a little bit. And that's largely because of weather. So this is this goes back to your point that some unexpected things happen. I Ukraine surviving as long as they have and still in the fight, which delayed all the economic effects that we expected to see. So it sounds like you're saying we haven't solved, no one's solved the problem. Europe hasn't solved its energy problem. It's just that the worst pain hasn't been felt yet. So they bought some time. Exactly. But, but it's not enough time. They cannot well, create a situation where they can get through this. 
It depends upon the sector. It depends upon the country. The further west you go from the Russian space, the easier it is to make the adjustment because the dependencies were less. Mm -hmm. uh, the problem with a place like Germany is that the, the industrial model is one that is the end result of 150 years of tinkering perfection. So in order for them to switch to a fundamentally different model, it has to not be energy intensive. It has to not be based on a worker demographic that is dying out. And it has to not be based on global trade. You don't do that in two years. What are the implications for the solidarity we've seen in Europe and in NATO? Well, I, I think actually the weak point isn't NATO. I think the Europeans really have decided to bite the bullet on this. I think the implications are for the European Union. If we no longer have Germany as the industrial heart of Europe, that means Germany is no longer the financial hub that makes Europe happen. Remember that the, the largest chunk of EU funds comes from Germany. And Germany is not just the, the German economic system is not just Germany. It's Belgium and the Netherlands and Austria and Poland and Slovakia and the Czech Republic and Hungary. And without the Germans, none of that works. So the Germans don't provide the funding that is necessary for the EU to function. The Germans don't provide the employment that allows the social model of Europe to function. Mm -hmm. uh, we're, we're, we're talking about a death blow to the EU that's, you know, an indirect outcome of the war. Do they see that yet? I think there's this visceral understanding that this is where this was ultimately going to go. And they are hoping against hope that there's going to be something that happens in the way this all shakes out, whether it's with the Americans, the Russians, or someone else, where they're going to find a way to muddle through. How they do that without the economic model, I don't know, and I don't think they do either. Yeah. Yeah. And well, everyone counts them, them for dead and the euro for dead in the European That's sovereign fair. crisis, and it didn't happen. Still right? here. Yeah. So the other big concern at the time was food, food supplies. Again, the Ukraine grain deal kept the supplies flowing, but are countries now changing the way they approach food security? How fragile is the global food supply chain right now? Well, let's start with why we didn't have a famine yet, because it's really, you know, avoiding famine, big deal. Uh, number one, Mother Nature was the kindest she has ever been in recorded history. And every agricultural zone in the, the world had good weather this last year. Uh, second, the sanctions were designed intelligently. They technically don't touch fertilizer at all. So a lot of the industrial infrastructure in Russia dates back to the 1960s, particularly the petrochemical system that deals with the fertilizer processing. And so we only had reductions of 20 to 40 percent from the Russian space. And then when the Russians lost the ability to export natural gas, they also lost the ability to export ammonium. So the Europeans, for the most part, have stopped producing nitrogen type fertilizer themselves because they used Russian inputs. So all of that added up to significant shortages in production globally. But everybody had a reserve, and most countries have now drawn down that reserve. So we're entering this year in a significantly worse position than we did last year, but no one's, no one's tank is completely dry yet. I've got some very big concerns for this year. Uh, when you're talking about places like Latin America, Sub-Saharan Africa, the Middle, I'm sorry, not the Middle East, so Latin America, Sub-Saharan Africa, South Asia, Southeast Asia, and Australia, none of them have any phosphate and none of them have any potash locally, except for like Chile. Uh, so they really are dependent on export from this region. Uh, but we've had a year. And in that year, a few new suppliers have been, I managed to spin out. Normally it takes three years to bring a phosphate or a nitrogen facility online and about 10 years for potash. And companies and countries have started to increase their output to incrementally take bites out of that. So as long as the Russian stuff doesn't fall off the market in a hot second, this will be relatively contained. But with Nord Stream offline, Europe is no longer part of the solution. And if we get into the spring and natural gas demand picks back up because of China, then a lot of East Asia can't be part of the solution because they use LNG to make natural gas-based mm -hmm. nitrogen fertilizer. And the Canadians are doing everything they can to speed up potash development, and they're hoping they can do it in seven years instead of 10. So we're still we're still right on the edge. And it doesn't take a very creative crisis to tip us into the disaster zone. So you know, we're talking about the sanctions being strategically set up so that there were enough 
things come about, both on energy and food, enough flows to to have everybody muddle through. At some point, if the Russians are not making progress, do they sort of adopt scorch earth policy and just say, we're cutting it off? It's entirely possible. This is this war is not about economics for the Russians. From their point of view, if they can't reestablish the forward crustal defense that the Soviet Union had, they will disappear from this earth. And they're right. Their demographics are terminal. This this was always going to be the last century of the Russian ethnicity. And they feel, and I think rightly, that if they can't forward position, then they're going to be fighting internal rebellions at home because probably now one in three Russian citizens is no longer ethnically Russian. And the non-Russian ethnics have very high birth rates, while the Russian ethics have very low birth rates. So they really do see this as the twilight of their lives and their rights. So if we get to a position where the Russians feel that the leverage makes sense, of course they'll do it. Uh, But from the European point of view, they're not going to force the issue as a unit, as a European Union. But there's still the possibility that some country like in Italy or Latvia will just decide, you know, enough is enough and start going after the maritime cargo. And that'll destroy the insurance picture for the entire region. And that is more than enough to type this into crisis in multiple sectors all at once. So on every front, everyone's bought time, but that, but there is no permanent solution. And, and the system is incredibly fragile, it sounds like. Absolutely. And, and bottom line here, the Russian stuff will all go away and never come back. That's cooked in now. Uh, the Russian technological base is weak. Their workforce is, was hollowed out before they started throwing hundreds of thousands of people at this conflict. They're un- incapable of maintaining their own system, especially when it comes to energy and petrochemicals and mining. A lot of the growth we have seen around the world since 1992 has been about the inclusion of places that didn't participate in the first wave of globalization into the system. That's Brazil. That's China. That's Russia. If you go back to 1992, there was only one product where Russia was a top three producer, and that was oil. Now they're a top three producer of over 20 different materials that we all use every day. Without the Russians participating eagerly, this will all go away. The question is whether it's this month, this year, this decade. So we all need to prepare for that one way or another. It's a major, a major supplier out of the global system, basically. Yeah. I mean, food and energy we've talked about. Lumber is in there. Palladium. Let's say you want semiconductors, palladium and neon, integral parts of any semiconductor fab facility. It's it's half the global total. So there's just a lot of things we're going to have to figure out how to do differently or how to do regionally if we still want the things we've become used to. Before we talk about that reshoring, uh, you, you talked about the workforce. I mean, there are reports of many, many young people, those who can leave, have left Russia about as a, a result of the, of the conflict. A million? Uh, roughly a million. So the, Russia has 8 million men in their 20s. About a million are now committed to the war and about another million have left. Is Putin still in power by the time this war ends? If Putin is not in power, someone very much like him will be. There was a coup in the Soviet period back in 1982. And at that point, the the KGB took over. And that was Chernomirdin and Adropov and Gorbachev. Putin is the heir to that legacy, which is another way of saying that the only people who are in the political elite in Russia are former KGB officers who trained during the Soviet period. Well, that means they're all in their late 50s or older. And there's only about 130 of them. And they all see the world the same way. And Putin has been able to purge that group over the last 22 years in order to make sure that there are no challengers to the throne. So as long as it's someone from that elite who's in charge, Putin's fine. And even if he wasn't, he died for health reasons, uh, one of his replacements would feel the same way. Uh, The only way we should expect a political shift is in Russia is if the military defeat is so catastrophic that you get a revolution. That is traditionally how you see political change in uh, the the former Soviet world. And we're just not there yet. So it wouldn't be it wouldn't be because their economy is so badly damaged. You you say that they have the mindset for that. It's got to be a military. the, The people who make decisions based on economic rationale in Russia have already left. So 
semiconductors you mentioned are are right front and center of this reshoring conversation. What does deglobalization look like in reality? If it's not even if it's not even a choice, as you're suggesting, it's just we're losing this major supplier. Things must change. Is it is the goal complete self sufficiency, a total vertical supply chain regionally, or is it just reducing dependence on players like Russia and China? There's there's two weak spots here. The first one is on the input side, specifically raw material. So the Russian Russians have one mine that produces 40% of global palladium. There's palladium in every semiconductor. And there is a two-country supply chain system to produce neon, which is used to focus the apertures of the etching lasers. And for that, the first stage is in Russia, and the second stage was in Ukraine in Mariupol. And that's now gone. So that's conservatively half of global neon is gone. So we know we're going to face a semiconductor crunch where we just can't produce the volume we've become used to until we replace those sources from somewhere else. Uh, if there was cheap palladium laying around, we would have done that already. And neon, that's a two to three year period to build out the physical infrastructure to make it happen. The Koreans have started, the Chinese have started, but it's a race against time. So that's problem one. Problem two is that there's not just one kind of semiconductor, so it gets kind of hairy really quickly. But let's start on the high end, because that's what everybody is concerned about. There are over 6,000 firms globally that are involved in semiconductor fab facilities for the 10 nanometer and better chips. 5,000 of them are involved with a company called ASML, which is a Dutch firm that does the lithography. Most of those 5,000 firms have no global competition. They're highly specialized. They do one thing for ASML, and most of them only have ASML as a customer. Now, these firms exist in China and Japan and South Korea and Taiwan and the United States and Canada and Mexico and above all Germany. See where I'm going here? <laughs> you miss a few of those pieces, and ASML in its current form cannot function. Now, I am a huge fan of ASML. I think it is the world's best company. It, it, when it, whether it's quality control, managing their supply chain, the technical innovation, the corporate secrecy. Oh, my God, they're so good at that. Uh, but they are the only company on the planet that makes the lithography machines, which are the most sophisticated machines humans build, for every single one of the fabs that produces the 10 nanometer and better chips. So one piece of that constellation falls out and the whole thing stops. So we don't need a war over Taiwan for this to break down. We need to rebuild the ecosystem in a more sustainable way. And since there are so many pieces to that, this is a multi-year process. So we should count on losing the leading edge chips on a global basis. On the low end, 90 nanometer and worse, the analog chips, the Internet of Things chips, that is 70, 80 percent within the Chinese system. We should count on losing those, too. Now, everything in the middle, the 90 to the 10, like the workhorse chips, most of what we need to do the things that we consider necessary, whether it's aerospace, uh, computers that are not servers, you know, that system is more redundant. That system has more players that uh, are, have more backup and there's more competition across the space. I actually think that general area will be fine. But if you want to do Internet of Things, if you want to do electric vehicles, if you want to do automated driving or AI, th that we need to write off for a few years. And that is going to be very difficult to build back at scale. OK, so and that's a huge statement because all of the innovation, uh, productivity, that everyone is hoping moves the global economy forward is really leaning into those areas. It's right. those high performing chips that are gonna fuel the economy that we're living in now, but also that we anticipate is gonna carry us forward for growth. Right, but in the worst case scenario, and I don't get to say good news very often, so take this, please take this to heart. Most of the functionality that we have now in our vehicles, in our automation systems, in our aerospace, in our computing, most of that is not as good as the 10 nanometer chips. So some of the newer phones are 10 nanometer or better, but most of them are 10 nanometer or worse. So we might have to take a bit of a breather, but most of what we have now will continue to work. It's just that the pace of improvement is going to slow considerably. It's not just that 90% of the good chips are made in 
in Taiwan. It's that the constellation of forces that allow them to be made in the first place, that is what's in danger. So, and that is true no matter what happens? Yes, because it doesn't matter where the break is. ASML is too distributed in the production system, and they have no backups internally, and there is no backup in the market. So even if Russia resolves itself, if there's tension with China, even if that resolves itself, if Germany's industrial base is offline, there's Only just takes too one many. Yeah, 10 nanometer chips and better are the ultimate distillation and physical manifestation of a perfect globalized environment that has mm -hmm. held for decades because it has taken decades for each and every one of these companies to get as good as they are at what they do. Is that alone motivation once there's a realization for some sort of political reset? I don't think the environment that gave us globalization for these last 50 years, 70 years is redoable. We don't have the population structure on a global basis to make it work anyway. Everybody's kind of aged out and you can't have global trade without global consumption. And now the demographics of Italy and Germany and Russia and China and Korea, are, they're all terminal. So the, the basis has never been there. We were always going to get here. We just now have political military issues that are kind of bringing our use by date forward. This was always going to be the decade that this all broke. The Russians and to a lesser degree, the Chinese are taking steps to make that happen faster. And the areas where there is population growth, I'm just roughly going to say emerging markets, even though that doesn't accurate, accurately capture it, but and they can't make up for it. Well, actually, the United States still has positive population growth, and Mexico has the healthiest demography for its own class, better than India or Brazil. You, you leave those two aside. There's not a lot left. Uh, the birth rate collapse in places like India and Brazil has been catastrophic. And I don't mean to suggest that they're facing a wall this decade or next decade. But the pace of growth is no longer this kind of bottomless supply of, of people and consumption that we once thought it was. And even if it was, they have not advanced economically to the point where their consumption can replace places like Europe or China. So uh, back to China for a second. Uh, sure. That. I, I saw a terrific headline uh, in an FP article recently that said China can make friends or break legs. It can't do both. It was referring. <laughs> it's a good headline, right? Kudos. Yeah. It, it was referring to some of the lending associated with the Belt and Road Initiative. Some of the countries they lend to, or you know, now for infrastructure problems, projects rather um, having trouble paying it back, and they, you know, how, how do they behave? But but actually, if you take that headline, I think it can be applied on a broader sense as well. Does it make sense for China to adopt an aggressive posture given some of the economic challenges it faces domestically? They're in a position where there's no real clear path forward. So I don't want to say one particular path is the one that will or won't work because none of them really will. The headline in specific, uh, the idea is that China did Belt and Road. And during COVID, they went and told everybody that these were all loans. And everyone's like, no, no, these were all totally grants. And the only country that tried to pay them back was Sri Lanka. And we know how that went. Uh, the Africans literally lapped the Chinese delegations out of the room when the Chinese asked to be paid back. So, you know, that's that was a trillion dollars wasted. Um, the way I would phrase it isn't so much break legs. Like people are only if you pay people to be your friends, they're only your friends as long as you pay them. Mm. Uh, taking a harsher stance with these countries is just sure to tank relations. I would say that the warrior wolf diplomacy has done a great job of that already. But there's no country or series of countries that the Chinese can threaten to get what they want. There's also no country or series of countries that they can invade and conquer to get them what they need. They need a bottomless supply of foreign technology and a bottomless supply of foreign consumption. And politically, that was always questionable. But now, technically, it's no longer even possible. The only country that might, might, might be able to help them out is the United States. But that means doing everything the United States' way. And I would even argue that with demographic decline around the world, even if China were to roll over and show the United States its belly, I'm not sure the United States any longer has the capacity to provide the scale of assistance that would help a system that has become as stilted and broken as the Chinese system is internally. I mean, this is a country where Enron-style investment has existed over an order of magnitude higher than it did in the United States, where every economic sector is teetered on and the, the brink of financial dissolution by the way we understand financial rules. 
It's the world's most dependent country in terms of imports and exports. It's completely dependent on energy imports and raw material exports. And at the end of the day, it has to sell to the American consumer. It's like, I'm not sure we could help if we wanted to. So what matters to Beijing, what matters to the CCP and G personally, is power preservation. And economic growth is no longer part of that conversation. It's about the politics. It's about the security lockdown. It's about setting the narrative. And to a degree, does that make China more dangerous? Certainly. But it also means that no matter what they do, China as an internationally diverse, economically wired country is not long for this world. And that means it's all going to be different for everyone in the not too distant future. Yeah. And there's there are always people who just find that statement uh, hard to believe you know, given the sort of size and power to date of China and that it's centrally controlled. Do you do you think a military invasion based on what you just said of Taiwan is is a real threat or is that a distraction? I'm going to go out on a limb here. I, I'm kind of a, the minority in my world that I really think that the chances of a, a Taiwan war are low. The, the, the way that the Chinese look at this is they've always considered the Russians to be a useful idiot. And if they're thinking of doing something that's going to stir the pot, they kind of nudge the Russians to try it first to see how it goes. And the Taiwan war would fall into that category. So they saw the Ukraine war as a useful proxy. And it hasn't gone the way that they thought. So, you know, number one, they thought the war would be physically easy because, you know, you can walk to Kiev and the Ukrainians have only been preparing for eight years. Well, you got to swim to Taipei and the Taiwanese have been preparing for 45. And so when the war in Ukraine got bogged down, like, ah, crap, assumption one, gone. Uh, assumption number two, they thought the Russian weapons were great. So they cloned them. They stole the IP just like they have for everybody else and cloned $3 trillion worth of them. And they're now having some very, very serious buyer's remorse, although I guess it would be theft remorse. Uh, so, you know, assumption two gone. Assumption three is that everyone will just get over it. Well, we now have the most robust sanctions regime in history on the Russians. And it would be a lot worse for China because Russia is a massive exporter of food and energy. China is the world's biggest importer of both. But I think what has really terrified the Politburo, are the boycotts. Because here you have private citizens and companies who, without prodding from their governments, have just walked away from you know $500 billion of sunk costs. There is no Chinese economic system without international trade, foreign technology, and market access. And the idea that Halliburton has left Russia on moral grounds. You know, there is no moral cover for anyone who wanted to stay in Russia. And the Chinese look at their system like, you know, they were doing a genocide long before the Russians started. You know, this is a country that isn't a democracy. This is a country that cracks down on protesters. This is a country with a horrible record of social management. There's a lot more places for Western ideology to kind of get the claws into if you really want to take it down. And they now know that the West is perfectly capable of doing it. The financial sanctions against Russia prompted a lot of conversation about the weaponization of the dollar. Sure. Would, would it prompt the Chinese to look to increase trade in yuan, it, especially when you're talking about oil, petro yuan, for example? Do you think that there is any possibility of that? Would Middle East producers entertain the idea of pricing oil in yuan? Could they find traction with that? I don't think there'd be a lot. Uh, one of the things we saw with the Russians and when they try to move away from the dollar and the euro, uh, they went into whatever currency was available. And honestly, there weren't a lot left at that point. But they did put about a quarter of a trillion dollars, if memory serves, into the yuan. And then when they tried to cash it in later, the Chinese were like, nope, we don't want that back. And so <laughs> the Russians have been forced to move back into the euro and the dollar, just do it really quietly because there just aren't, aren't a lot of options. And then, of course, they fly around a lot of gold. That's really their most reliable way of getting around sanctions. So there's not a lot of options. Uh, in the case of the Persian Gulf, there might there might be some room there because the Saudis in particular, now that the United States is no longer their largest consumer and no longer their security guarantor, they've been looking for a new friend. The Chinese have come in with a lot of money and a lot of demand. And so the Saudis have done kind of a co-investment thing in industrial plant in China and refineries, just like they did in the United States. And having a yuan trade for that specific sales line, that makes a degree of sense. But keep in mind that if there is a conflict that involves China and the United States, no ships will be coming and going from China. So the Saudis know full well that if you are involved in a hot war with the United States, 
your tankers don't go there. And so there would be no point in a hot war scenario for the Saudis to do that. Yeah, in a hot war scenario, we are talking about the deindustrialization of the Chinese system and famine within a year. Because this is a country that imports 75% of its energy and 75% of the inputs that allow it to grow its own food. Uh, if, 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 I don't think there will be, if mm. we do have a conflict over Taiwan that does involve either Japan, the United States, Vietnam, or India, because any one of them can do this. That is the end of China as a modern industrialized power with over a billion people. We're, we're discussing, you know, in that region and the, the, you know, China needing that global trade. India has really set itself up as the alternative, as everyone's looking to to make sure they reduce their dependence. We're going to be touching on India as, as part of a, a series and talking about the digital transformation because they have managed in a way at scale to start pulling people into their formal economy um, through their digital ID system that they've put in place. Is India in any way set up or able to help in this situation where we're, I don't mean help, but contribute or fill a gap of this declining China supply chains that are now reshoring but are going to be broken for a while? What? How does India fit into this picture? Uh, the answer is yes and no. So I am broadly bullish on India. It's set apart from most of the world's problems. It's the first stop on the, the, the shipment route from Persian Gulf to uh, the oil markets of Asia. It's never going to have an energy crisis. Uh, and it's security issues with Pakistan and Bangladesh, not that they're minor, but they're, they're kind of ossified. And they only are going to boil up into a hot war if something goes really, really wrong in multiple places. So I don't think it's very likely. So the problems of India aren't going to go away. So the digitalization, for example, that you brought up, that can happen, but never for the whole population. But that's okay. Uh, if only a third of the economy, if only a third of the population get brought into the modern age, that's still more people than the European Union. And you can have a growth story. And just like the United States and NAFTA, we're going to have to build a lot of industrial plants to replace what we're going to lose from Germany and China. So will India. So that's a growth story, too. But India will never have partners. The countries on its borders are either too poor or too hostile. They will never be integration targets. And everyone else is too far away. And the, Indi the Indians have never been in favor of free trade. So any manufacturing industrial build out in India is going to be for the Indians, just like most of the build out in North America is going to be for the most of the North Americans. That will limit the quality level, but that doesn't mean it's not going to be successful. So India is India doing things for India on, based on its own logic, and that is a very good story. But if you think that they're about to become a major global power, no, they never have been because they've been too isolated. So you can have a very strong success story and still be it not part of a global story. Mm, interesting. So there, there have been a lot of people sort of you know, India also a, a democracy, um, and and you know people see that as an advantage. But there's been a lot of concern globally about the rise of authoritarianism, right? Sure. This is a, a sort of a, in elections all over the place. If you look any of those sort of shift to the right, or or I don't even know if it's proper to say that, but if you look at where you've seen this sort of move to the right or move to more strongman type of. Uh, regimes, they look at the Russian invasion of Ukraine and think what? <laughs> this really isn't going the direction we thought it was going to go. Uh, and you're right. It's not a left versus right thing. It's a, it's a dictator versus non-dictator. It doesn't matter where in the political spectrum you can. We've had plenty of examples. or It doesn't mm -hmm. matter where in the political spectrum you've come from. We've got plenty of examples from across the spectrum of how you know, just have individuals who have decided that they are the big man. Uh, on the whole... I've been very encouraged by the events of the last year because we've seen in most places authoritarianism has been failing. They can't generate the economic activity past a certain point that is necessary to maintain public support. I think we're going to see some cracks in the Chinese facade in the not too distant future. The Russian system is clearly in failure and the Chinese system is not far behind. Uh, it's not that I think the Chinese system was sustainable, but political breakdowns within Beijing have now reached the point that it's it's glaringly obvious who anyone, to anyone who's willing to really have an open mind on it that we really are seeing a system that is in its final stages of dysfunction. Uh, there are exceptions. Uh, I am concerned about what's going on in Mexico. 
Uh, AMLO has decided that he wants to be not so much Nicaragua, but Cuba. No, that's not even fair. I mean, Turkey is probably the, the closest comparison to what's going on in Mexico right now, where you've got a system that still has all of the trappings of democracy, but you have a leader who's actively trying to break them down. Now, the people are pushing back. And the other power centers of pushing back. And in Mexico, very important here, they have term limits. So we really only have another year, year and a half of AMLO before we get someone else in. So I'm not hugely concerned. In the case of Turkey, Erdogan totally bungled the earthquake recovery. And that, even odds, is going to cost him his job. Because we are, it looks like we are going to have a national unity candidate running against him. And in a relatively free and relatively fair election, he will lose. Then we get to worry about the new guy because, you know, we don't know a lot about him and he's never been in office before. But these systems are for the first time seeing the free world willing to use economic and security tools against them. That is new. One of the tenets of globalization was the idea that in time, economic growth and integration will force all these systems to move for democracies. And throughout the 90s and the 2000s, there, there was a lot of reason to think that that was true. And then it flipped in the 2010s. We're now seeing that if the West and the free world decide to weaponize what they have, they can really tear some stuff up. And so... I'm not sure we're getting into the Biden administration's idea of the autocracies versus the democracies, and it's a fight to the end, way too soon to say that that's how it's going to go. But at a minimum, there's a lot of serious thinking going on. And you can see very easily the difference between the authoritarian systems, your Mexico's, your India's, your Turkey's, and your dictatorial systems, your Russia's and your China's, where the decision making cannot happen anymore because the information flows to the guy at the top have broken down. In the other cases, you may have egotistical leaders that don't like to hear things they don't want to hear, but they're still hearing it. And so there's a degree of awareness, there's a degree of plurality that does not exist in places like Beijing or Moscow. Doesn't that, that economic weaponization and, and willingness to use it, won't that just prompt people to find an alternative? Uh, well, the problem is there really isn't one. Uh, the United States controls the ocean, and if it ever just, if push ever really does come to shove, that's the end of international trade for that country. Uh, the United States plus Europe plus Japan is 80% of all financial heft in the wider world and roughly two-thirds of global consumption. So if you do want to make a go of it free of these pesky constraints, you have to work with what's left. And what's left is largely dependent upon what you're trying to cut out. So there will always be a question of whether or not the free world is dedicated and willing to put the shoulder into it. And it's now clear that there are certain lines that if you cross the West is. So it's, it's a calculus. It's economic growth. What pace do you feel that is necessary? Because you're never going to be able to really insulate yourself. It's a question of tolerance. So we have this supply chain situation, which economically I think is really important. And this is this is sort of something that we now understand a year a year into this conflict. We have this supply chain reshoring or disruption that seems to to you know it's going to present a problem regardless of wh whether we see a resolution in Ukraine. Um, the map's been redrawn. How much? This is happening at the same time we have central banks raising interest rates, we have inflation. How damaging will this be? I mean, what, what are the implications for the global economy? Well, it's going to be massively expensive, but that expense is going to be borne in two ways. So you're going to have places like the United States that are going to have to roughly double the size of their industrial plant in an environment of more expensive capital and more expensive labor. That is going to be hugely inflationary. So my estimate is 9 to 15% for the next five years. That assumes we actually build out the industrial plant. If we fail to do that, we're probably going to have similar inflation rates, but at the end of it, we will have product shortages of every type because we have failed to build out the industrial plant. So for us, there's not a lot of choice. You might as well get the growth that goes with it. And when I say 9 to 15% inflation, keep in mind that this is to build out a supply chain system that is in North America, that serves North America, that uses North America resources and finance, uh, and is simpler and shorter and closer to the end consumer. This is a growth play, not an inflation threat. Inflation is the side effect of what will be the fastest growth in the country's history. This is a good story. 
But if you are a country that has dominated part of the supply system before, now you have all the stranded industrial plant that doesn't have a consumer or maybe doesn't even have the raw materials necessary to make it work in the first place. There you get a mix of inflation and deflation, uh, the most destructive combination you can possibly get as you have shortages or overproduction, sometimes even in the same sector. Uh, and that is where you think of a Great Depression as perhaps the best case outcome. And who who's most at risk for that? China is absolutely the top of that list. What about Japan? Japan is an interesting case because, you know, the Ch Japanese get a lot of crap for having 0% growth for, what, 30 years now? But they've seen all of this coming, the demographic implosion, the rise of China, the fall of China. And so they took proactive steps over the last 30 years to get ahead of it. Uh, now, that cost them economic growth. But they would forward position a lot of their industrial plant in countries with better demographic profiles and more local consumption. And that has allowed them to, I don't want to say skate by and ignore these issues, but they've pre-positioned for it. So they've moved a huge amount of industrial plant into Southeast Asia and especially the United States. And they're now integrating with other younger countries in a way that preserves their economic functionality. Now, this is still the world's oldest demographic structure, and they are not aging all that gracefully. But they've even taken some steps there between uh, encouragement for young people to form families on one side and the advancement of robotics on the other. They actually now have a higher birth rate than China, Korea, or Taiwan. Wow, I don't think a lot of people realize that because we always think of Japan as the aging society. Yeah, I don't mean to suggest that their birth rate is high. <laughs> uh, but I'm just saying that they, they've taken some steps to mitigate a lot of this, and they are no longer a massively export-driven economy. They've managed to relocate a lot of this stuff to the other side of tariff barriers. Couldn't China just do that? It's, it's an issue of scale. Chinese would have to do it to an order of magnitude or order of three. Yeah, factor of three more. Uh, and they would have to also do what the Japanese did, which is roll over and show the Americans your belly. I remember that when Abe, uh, former Japanese Prime Minister Abe, came to the United States, he was forced to accept a insulting trade deal uh, in order to get this sort of integration. But it worked. And then there's the time issue. Uh, the Chinese have been working on this since the late 80s. Yeah. And, in, and if anything, it, it, you know, rather than friendlier relations, it seems to be swinging the other way right now. Yeah. So as we as we look out... Two broad sort of questions to end with. What's the greatest geopolitical risk that's underappreciated right now? Oh, that's absolutely Mexico. Uh, if AMLO really does torch uh, Mexican democracy, it's going to be much more difficult for the United States to maintain a constructive relationship. Or if the Jalisco New Generation cartel does succeed in breaking north of the border. You know, this, this is a drug cartel that kind of exists in Americans' minds in the right way. Until now, the dominant cartel, the Sinaloa, has been a corporate entity. They think of drugging running as a business and violence as a means to an end, not an end. Jalisco New Generation is the opposite. It's a gang that just happens to run drugs. Mm -hmm. And if they cross into the United States, they will go on a, a violent spree that will force the Americans to revisit all things Mexico and drugs and trade. And this is now our largest trading partner. This is our single biggest partner in the world to come. And the, the supply chains that we're reshoring, almost all of them that matter, have a big Mexican component. And so if you interlace the drug war into that, that that's a huge problem. It's not guaranteed. AMLO will be gone in a year and a half. And if, if, it, Well, we think term limits can sometimes be... Well, he tried to amend the Constitution already and failed. So he personally will no longer be the president. Doesn't mean that he can't undo some of the dem democratic reforms that we've seen in the last 30 years. So the, the risk is there, but the risk of him being the big guy is not. Um, and there's nothing to say that Jalisco New Generation might disintegrate because the, the drug cartels in Mexico tend to do that from time to time. But that is the biggest risk, in my opinion, uh, to the American way of life and the American economy. And we have to end with demographics because sure. it's so important to a lot of the work you do. Um, the trends tend to play out over decades. So, you know, people can ignore them or not, not appreciate them as much. But are there implications in the shorter term when it comes to demographics that we need to be paying attention to? Sure. So uh, the issue is as your population ages, it depends on where the bulge in your structure is. 
So if your bulge is for people 45 and under, you tend to be a consumption-led society, very high growth, very high inflation. If your bulge is people roughly 40 to 65, you're a technocracy because you have older people, not a lot of consumption, but a huge amount of capital. That's where a lot of the advanced world has been for the last 20 years. And so that's one of the reasons why capital has been so cheap. It hasn't just been monetary policy. It's been that the baby boomers have been at the capital-rich point of the world. Well, in the fourth quarter of last year, the majority of the world's baby boomers had aged into mass retirement, which meant that they were liquidating all of their savings because they can't have a very forward-looking portfolio when you're in retirement because if there's a market crash, you lose everything and you no longer have the income to recover. So capital costs are going up and they will continue to go up for the next decade, independent of what happens with the economic cycle or the Fed. That is now baked into the cake. We have passed mm -hmm. the Rubicon and we are never going back to the financial environment that we've seen in the last several years. In fact, we shouldn't expect capital costs to start coming down appreciably until the millennials are in their 50s. That's not until the mid 2030s. So everything that we have to deal with now, starting now, we have to do so with less capital. And that is going to radically slow the rate of economic growth. Now, if you have capital in this environment, and I'm looking at you Gen X out there because all Gen Xers are in their 50s now, uh, and assuming you can keep it away from the tax man, big, big detail, uh, the rate of return you're going to get is going to be significant because we just don't have a world awash in free money anymore. Uh, but there's not enough capital for what needs to be done. So there's pros and cons based on who you are and what you need. Yeah. You mentioned tax rates, if you can avoid taxes, which is a big mm -hmm. if. It sounds like you think those are all going up. Well, the, the baby boomers have built into the system a very robust, very generous, very expensive set of benefits for themselves. And because life expectancy in the United States is in excess of 70, they are going to be able to vote to preserve those for a significant amount of time. And the millennials, the second generation, biggest generation we've ever had, uh, does not want the baby boomers to move in with them. From their point of view, living with their parents was a one-way experience. So you've got the two biggest generations in American history voting for a very robust benefits program that all has to be paid for by Gen X, and there's not enough of them. So in any ballot box competition, Gen X will lose. So it'll be a fight for Gen X to benefit uh, from their financial position. Peter, a lot to think about once again, as always, when we catch up with you. Thank you so much for that. Not a problem. Has it really been a year? Peter and I joked at the start of the interview, but so much has changed since Russia invaded Ukraine that it's sometimes hard to process all of the repercussions. In this conversation, we tried to sift through the fallout and look at how the war has accelerated some major political and economic shifts. Peter sees the breakdown of global supply chains as one of the biggest casualties of this war. This is no longer just about supply shocks in energy or food. This is a reworking of the global trade system. If you recall in Roger's interview with Dario Perkins in this series, Dario talked about more regionalization that's ultimately inflationary and will lead to slower growth. Peter shares some of this view and raises the alarm level. The major pain points. Number one, Russia. Zion believes it is still their war to lose. It's not economic for them, and this will continue, meaning regardless of the outcome, Russia's out of the global supply chain for decades. This carries huge implications for energy, commodities, lumber, as well as palladium used in semiconductor chips. Number two, Peter continues to believe that China's economic system is teetering on the edge. They need to mend relations with the West, but President Xi has insulated himself so much, it's no longer clear whether rational minds will prevail. Peter predicts the days of China as an internationally engaged, economically wired country are waning. If true, this runs counter to the China reopening narrative, which suggests that the reemergence of China onto the world stage will help boost global growth. We already saw some of those hopes dashed by China's recent, more conservative growth targets. As bearish as he is on China, Peter doesn't see an invasion of Taiwan, but he is concerned some bureaucrat looking to curry favor with top leadership in Beijing will do something inflammatory. 
Third, and perhaps most controversial, Germany. Peter worries the loss of the Nord Stream pipeline and strain on natural gas supplies to Europe spells the beginning of the end of the entire German industrial model. Now, this is an interesting statement, especially since natural gas prices, which spiked following the invasion, have fallen sharply, correcting back to pre-war levels. Peter argues the fall in prices is due to temporary factors which won't last. He details some solutions the Germans are pursuing, but warns that time is not on their side. The loss of this manufacturing financial engine is not just an issue for Germany. He calls it a potential death blow to the EU. Now, his thesis is certainly not mainstream and runs contrary to investor sentiment. The Euro stocks 50 index and German DAX are both up 20 percent in the past six months. As always, this is a conversation about probabilities. We touch on some of the things that could happen to mitigate these risks, but Peter believes even if some of them are resolved, the forces reshaping supply chains are irreversible. Reshoring will come at a huge cost. Capital will be diverted, labor will be needed, and inflation will soar. How high? Peter's guess, 9 to 15 percent. Now, if there's good news here, it's that Peter sees this as a growth story, not an inflation threat, which puts him in a different camp than some of the other guests in our series. He predicts countries that are building up new regionalized supply chains will see rapid growth. But for those who used to dominate, it will mean stranded assets and declining power. The other bit of good news is that the severe energy and food shortages predicted at the start of the war have been averted for now. Fine-tuned sanctions gave governments breathing room. An unusually warm winter in Europe helped. But Peter warns the economic implications of the war have been deferred, not resolved. And time is ticking. Hey there, revolutionaries. To join a community sharing insights like you just watched, head over to realvision.com. There you will get unbiased insights and exclusive access to the very best, brightest, and biggest names in finance. Be a part of our community of lifelong learners. See you there.